All right, man, I'm excited to have you on the podcast because I've known you for a long time. Uh, we've worked together a little bit and it's uh, it's been a while since I've talked to you. So it's been cool to watch what you're doing, how well things are going. And, and you're just a wealth of knowledge, man. And, and it's right up the alley of what I love most about strength training. You know, it's, it's, it's athletic, it's strength, it's power, it's the everyday person becoming an athlete. It's, it's a lot of the same things that you preach about your athletes. I preach to my gen pop clients. And I think that's what's mm-hmm. going to make this podcast really interesting, but before yeah, we, dive, thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Before we dive into nuts and bolts, like give me your background, man. Like how did you get started into training? How, how, how are you here today? Yeah. So I was a, uh, well, I was a lifelong athlete. Like most of us, um, played three sports growing up, basketball, baseball, football, um, baseball was the one that really stuck with me. And so like all of us, you know, you got super into training because you start lifting, whatever, in the beginning of high school, you see massive changes in your body. Uh, you see massive improvements in like your performance. Um, so long story short, like I, I caught the fire a little bit then that carried over through to college. And it's the same thing. You just see like the changes and the carryover. And of course you fall in love with the training itself. Um, and I actually, I, I didn't really know that I wanted to go into training, coaching, strength, conditioning for a, a decent amount of time. Um, but I was brought to Pennsylvania uh, by my now wife, who is at a health club. Um, there was a spot that opened up for starting up a sports performance program. And then we grew. So I was the only one that was doing it then. Um, we grew. And so now we have like over 100 athletes. We have multiple coaches. Um, and then as you know, I've been doing some writing for T nation, some bodybuilding.com stack simply faster. Uh, so it's a mixture of that. So right now, m- most of my time is spent working on the sports performance program. And then I do the writing content stuff on the side. Uh, let's dive right into, uh, athletic training based on like your, I mean, your, your, your background's great. I think it's, it's obvious that you're qualified for this, but give me like the, the biggest mistakes athletes are making right now like when you get somebody in the door what do you see commonly happening that you need to I hate to use the word fix but do differently let's just say well it's interesting because as we were talking about a little bit before this there are a lot of commonalities between athletes and and general population so like the stuff that we see the most is going to be and I would say there's a big carryover it's um the basic you know sticking to like the dogmatic approaches of you know, the squat bench deadlift. And, and like when I was in college, um, we were big into, and I can say this now because our strength conditioning coach, I'm friends with it now. Uh, it was like your classic, like football, you know, squat bench deadlift clean, you go over all that stuff. And it really fails to account for like all the little stuff that we need to do in between those. Like that's like our single leg work and our core work and, you know, certain types of like rowing. So when I see athletes and general population coming in the first place. And it's not really their fault because this is what they see everywhere. Um, they're, they're sticking with the basic lifts exercises that they're not necessarily ready to do or benefit them at all. Um, so I would say that's a big one. I mean, and we could go across the board, um, if we're talking, you know, always going for heavier loads, not training across, uh, multiple spectrums. And, and kind of like we were talking about before this, I think there's a huge carryover between the athletic and the general population in terms of like what qualities we should be training. And, and if we have like all those buckets, right. So we have like our, you know, our movement quality, we have our conditioning, we have our strength power. Um, and this is, this is a big one, even with athletes is that they fail to train across that full spectrum. And I'm a big believer in, in like, if we're looking at like the force velocity curve, not to go too nerdy with it, we have like our absolute strength, we have our absolute speed, and then a little bit of everything in between. And we really want to make sure that we like train the the multiple qualities that are going to like bring everything else up, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so that, that's like the big one that stands out to me. And then there's, you know, like I said, like there's the exercise selection, um, managing like volume, intensity, frequency, um, like anything else. Yeah, that's a, it's funny. One of the things I have on my list to discuss with you is balancing all these different modalities and and focuses. But before getting that, something that came to mind when you were talking is, is like, how simple should the program be? You know, there's, there's a lot of people who I think overcomplicate 
programming and it should be much more simple. But at the same time, like if you look at it, bench squat, deadlift, clean, I mean, that's pretty fucking simple. You know, it's, it's right. not doing much. It's almost too simplistic. So like, how do you gauge this like range of complexity or specificity and, and, and what influences that? No, yeah, that's so true. So I, I like, um, I think it was Mike Boyle. He was saying that people always want to think outside the box, you know, like the novel variations, you know, always changing their programs. And, and he says, there's a reason why there's a box. And it, I, it really like resonated with me. I ha I've had a few people ask me like, hey, how do you come up with all these variations and everything like that? And it's funny because like, I look at our programming and I think, you know, it really is basic. Like we have this template, we're going to do some sort of power work. You know, we're going to do some sort of basic compound strength work. We're going to do accessory work to, you know, reduce injury risk, um, work on weak links, uh, all of that. And so I think it really comes if we're going back to like that box concept of we have this template and we have these qualities that we want to train. And it really is just a matter of like individualizing it based on the person um, and training all of those like movement patterns across multiple, you know, set rep schemes in different ways. And if we're going to like the athletic versus general population, that could look totally different for different people, right? If I have, you know, athletes, I'm going to have them sprinting. I'm going to have them maybe doing some sort of Olympic lift. Um, if I'm talking with general population and people are banged up and they have, you know, wrist elbow problems, like I'm not going to clean them. Um, we can work on medicine balls, jumps. And it's the same thing with like a squat bench deadlift. Like we know that those are like fundamental movement patterns and that there's nothing wrong with those movement whatsoever. Like, I think you're in the same boat as me. Like we like squatting, benching and deadlifting. Yeah. Um, but it's just a matter of like fitting it to that individual person and weighing that risk versus reward. So you mentioned a template and I know we both do this, but I'd be interested in your, um, as much as you can give us without giving yeah. away <laughs> your product, but uh, no, it's all good. what is your template? You know, cause I think if trainers can understand and even just fitness enthusiasts can understand a template in which different exercises fit into or different intensities and, and focuses, whether it's power or just simply mobility and warming up or it's accessory mm -hmm. work, which I definitely think is an under prioritized aspect of training exactly. in general. Mm -hmm. um, but what does this template look like that you use and, and why do you use it? So, you know, with, and again, it's the same for athletes, general population, because there's, there's so much carryover and people always walk in with the same issues, weak links. Um, but we always start with some sort of warm up, and I, and I've gotten a little bit more flexible with the warm up, like in terms of what people need to do to prepare. Um, but we'll do your basic, you know, we'll do some short foam rolling stuff. We'll do some mobility drills, correctives, um, activations, and again, you know, if if we're dealing with younger athletes who don't have any issues, you know, we go go through that per usual. But the meat and potatoes is going to go um, after that. We're going into power movements. So the big difference is with our athletes, we'll sprint them. Um, if I have, you know, a 45 year old couple come in, I'm, I'm not going to sprint them, but we, we work on that power. So that'll be some sort of medicine ball throw or a box jump or like some, some light lateral stuff. And, and for athletes, we know that we're going like for performance, but if we're looking at somebody who's not playing a sport, number one, I mean, it's, it's fun for them, right? Like to feel athletic. Eh? And number two, if we're looking at like real life, if this is a person who's 40 years old or 70 year old, like they're going to need to be able to move with some speed. If it's, you know, a fall, they need to be able to catch themselves. Um, if they're going upstairs and have like a trip. Um, and we know that adults lose power 1.7 times fast as strength as they age. So that's a big one. So, but, but it, we're going box jump or box jumps, different variations of jumps, medicine ball throws with the athletes. Like we'll ramp it up a little bit, um, make it more advanced depending and then, I mean, like we all know, like the strength portion is going to be pretty basic. If we have somebody coming in two or three times a week, we're going to do some sort of squat, hinge, push, pull. Um, the basic like movements that we're talking about individualized for them. And it's going to be the same thing with the general population as well. Um, so, and I think you, you program it the same way. We're totally on the same page here, but we'll start with, you know, one or two basic strength movements. And that's where we're going to work on our more like absolute strength end of things. And then after that, we're going to work on our, like I'm saying, single leg work, rows, um, different core work, carries, all of that stuff. So I, I guess to distill it, it would be some sort of like brief warm up, dressing, or addressing, you know, whatever linchpins we need to. We're going to go through power. We're going to go through a multifaceted strength program. And then depending on the person, you know, we'll end them with some sort of conditioning, whether that's something that's high intensity and brief, 
um, or we're just going to chill them out for 20 minutes when they finish and have them walk on a treadmill. Um, across the board, I mean, it's really similar between athletes and general population. If you understand the the sequence of events, it is, right? It's just, it, it comes down to exercise selection, it seems like. And I think <clears throat> one of the things that goes unnoticed in our industry is exercise sequencing. There's not a lot of research on it. Um, it's hard to do any type of research on it. And, and most people focus so much on uh, intensity being load and volume that they kind of miss the forest for the trees, right? And I, and I know people who will get way better results from the same amount of intensity or same amount of volume by just stacking the program properly, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically what you're getting at, right, right? Right, And even if we're going for like, so, so say it's, you know, one of our more advanced, like general population, if they're going for like a bodybuilding show or strongman or whatever it is, like if we're going for like pure strength or hypertrophy and we're dealing with like the, the washed up meatheads or whatever it is, like we're going to get better strength and hypertrophy gains if we do some sort of power movement before, right? Like we're going to potentiate the system, fire up the CNS. Um, there's some research out there that says doing some sort of power work before you hit a muscle is going to not only increase performance, but like also increase muscle fiber recruitment. So it's not only, you know, a matter of like convenience or anything that okay, it is supposed to stack up on top of each other to make everything more effective. Yeah. And I mean, it's the same thing with like a warm up. like even though we're not going to take forever going through it and, and rolling around on the floor for 20 minutes, like we're trying to do some things where we can enhance the movements that we're going to do. What does that look like? I'd, lo I'd love for you to dive into that a little bit, just because I think warming up is one of those things where like when mobility became really popular, it almost became like a, a five minute warm up turned into like a 30 right. minute session, right. you know? And, and I think there's some people need more than five minutes. Right. Some people don't, right. but like, I, I'd love to hear like the average person who doesn't necessarily have any injuries, but wants to perform well and doesn't want to get any injuries. What are you having them mm -hmm. do? So this is like, unfortunately somewhat controversial, but we're going to start them with some sort of soft tissue work. Um, and we're not like trying to break up scar tissue or like break up knots or anything like that. Cause obviously we know foam rolling doesn't do that, but what it's going to do is, is well, number one, I mean, it's going to chill people out, whether we're talking with athletes or adults, like they'll be able to relax a little bit. They'll be able to breathe, um, kind of get themselves in like a, a state that's ready to train. So that's the first one we'll start. I mean, nothing crazy, you know, maybe like a couple minutes working on whatever's, you know, bothering them or tender. We'll go into some like brief mobility drills after that. If it's um, someone who's like perfectly healthy. Um, so that's just going to be like our big rocks, like pecs, lats. Um, if we're going lower body, we'll go like hip flexors, adductors. And that'll be like two to three, two to three, maybe four things um, over the course of like four ish minutes. And then we'll go into some sort of like activation drills, which is going to be like our you know, and I'm just throwing out basic examples here, but our glute bridges and our face pulls and, and different stuff like that, that'll be, you know, two sets of something. Then we go, and, and this is where it kind of differs a little bit between athletes and general population, because for athletes, that's when we're going to get them into like dynamic stuff, um, like different, like speed drills, et cetera. But for the general population, that's kind of when we go into like that power work or, or I say general population, but if we're working with, you know, like, uh, a uh, washed up athlete who still wants to, you know, train like an athlete, or if we're dealing with someone who wants to, you know, focus on like strength or hypertrophy, like we're going to follow the same kind of the same process, but I would say, yeah. So we go, we go some soft tissue work, uh, some mobility stuff. I say corrective, like with air quotes. Um, and then we move on to, to activation movement pattern practice, et cetera. Do you ever, uh, from like a coach's perspective, do you ever just put this stuff into the actual program versus into a separate warm up? And the reason I ask that is because a lot of times when people see warm up, they'll skip it, you know, especially gym pop. Like if you have an athlete who is either a getting paid to be an athlete or B wants mm -hmm. to become paid for an athlete at some point in time, they're going to do whatever the fuck the paper says, no yep. matter what. Right. Yep. But I think for gen pop, sometimes you almost have to trick people into doing the warm up. So I'll oh, put like okay. activation and primers and stuff like actually into the sets, like it's, it's accounted for in your volume. Right. And, and, and a lot of times, like, cause we do have people, I mean, I'm kind of like this in a way We just want to get to training, you know? And so we'll mix in some stuff like, Hey, this is a primer. This is pump work, whatever it is, you know, and if we're working yeah. like a face pull, sometimes we'll even throw in like a, like a sled March. Um, oh yeah. I mean, after the foam rolling and like the mobility stuff, we kind of try to sneak that in there. And that like, sometimes we'll do like fillers, you know, if we're, 
super setting, like a, some sort of squat with like an adductor rock, but I'm with you. We definitely kind of have to sneak it in sometimes. How far, like, w- w- what do you do to create the balance between maximizing potential and recovery? And I, and I guess what I mean by that is I think there's like this, it, it's hard for a lot of people to understand how hard to go, you know, in, in, I think most of us can say like, you're not going to get results unless you really fucking push yourself. You know, like there mm-hmm. is that line that you do have to kind of tiptoe on to really get results. But at the same time, if you go over that too often or too frequently, you're not going to recover enough. Then no adaptation recurs. Um, so right, what are right. you doing with your athletes and your people to make sure there is that balance? Like, do you have some like rules or principles in place as far as like how many days a week they can do this type of training or how many days a week they can do this or hours of sleep, anything like that that you're implementing? Well, it's, yeah, it's interesting. So I was talking to um, someone about this yesterday and we, we, and I know you've talked about this a lot, but we have to look at like stress as like kind of a holistic thing. And so a lot of times if we're doing with an athlete, you know, it could be schoolwork, uh, girlfriend, boyfriend, if we're dealing with general population, it could be work type stuff. So we do try kind of try to have to get a feel for that. And then if we're looking more specifically, like at the training aspect of it, I mean, I think it's, we could look at it in a few different ways. Um, people first and foremost, and I'm guessing most of the people that are listening are probably pretty familiar with like listening to their body. And if we're talking about like rate of perceived exertion, um, we can go into that. But I think a lot of it comes down to, well, I'll say two things. Number one is going to be um, like kind of trying to balance the training that we're doing with whatever stressors are going on. And as coaches, that can be tricky. You know, like we'll have to keep a pretty watchful eye on people. And I think the other thing, and this is like kind of a concept in and of itself, is this whole idea of load capacity. Are you familiar with that? Mm -mm. So pretty much what the premise is, is we all have this base capacity, which is like what our body is capable of doing. And we have how much load we're applying, whether that's weight or impact or whatever it is. And so if we have somebody come in for the first time and they have like a low capacity, like they're not able to do much, um, then we need that we know that we need to like manage the load carefully because the concept is that when our load far out like exceeds the capacity that's when they're going to be issues and so we need to like keep them somewhat close as we go up and like meet them where they're at i remember hearing something uh matt wenning are you familiar so it was something about how like on his bench press days he'll do like four sets of 25 dumbbell bench before he starts his workout And like some of us hear about that, like if I did that, I would be absolutely smoked, you know, but that's something where he's built up the capacity to handle that type of load. Um, And I also think that that concept can kind of be applied to, you know, a lot of questions in training, like how much volume should I use? How much intensity should I use? And like, obviously we want to be smart and listen to our bodies, but at the same time, like if you build up that capacity and again, you know, not a lot of our athletes are going to have that right off the bat. I mean, I won't have that right off the bat if I'm not doing that. Um, But I would say that that's a big factor. And that kind of goes into like playing the long game, which you always talk about. Um, But I would, yeah, so I I would come bring it down to like load capacity, which is um, kind of like knowing where our clients are, knowing if we're talking about our own training, knowing where we are um, and gradually building that up. And then trying to, it's not like a sexy topic, but trying to balance the stress of training with whatever we have going on. And kind of the, t- I mean, it, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, it's kind of like, uh, have you heard of uh, MRV from mm-hmm. uh, Dr. Mike Isertel? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. To me, that's like the bodybuilding conversion of this load capacity, right? It's, it's how much volume can you handle at your maximum capacity? And I think like mm-hmm. understanding, and this is why I tell people like in order to utilize RPE or RIR properly, you actually have to fail. Like you have to know Absolutely. what it feels yeah, like. Agreed. To, go to failure to understand how to gauge that. So I think the same applies in like load capacity or MRV. Like you need to kind of walk to that line or go past that line to see where that line's even at. And then you can basically adjust your training going forward based on that. And I think it just goes, uh, it just kind of echoes what you said about the long game. Like you're not going to find that out right away. Like you actually have to go through maybe even multiple training blocks to figure out where your baselines are, where your top lines are, and then create a structured program to follow that, which is why like when people get into this kind of stuff, I'm always like, even if you don't sign a contract committing for a year in your mind, just commit to at least a year. Like, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Like you really got to put everything you have into this for a long period of time. 
No, I, I agree hundred percent. And I mean, I even realize, like in my training sometimes, you know, we know if we're doing like a basic movement, once you're like experienced enough with training, you know, like when you're on the brink of failure, right? Like, you know what an eight or a nine RP is. Um, but even sometimes with like, if we're talking like accessory work or even like isolation work, like a lot of times we do stop ourselves short of coming close to failure, even if you don't really feel it. Um, and so, I, no, I agree. I think sometimes you do kind of have to push that line and almost go, and obviously this is not something that we want to do in, in training all the time, but like you kind of have to figure out where that threshold is. Yeah, 100%, man. Um, how, are you, how are you finding that would be the next question I have for you because I think that I've gotten this question a lot about volume. Like how do I know what my max volume is? And a lot of times I'm, it's like the be patient. Like you yeah, really right. got to kind of test things out. But how are you going about testing this load capacity thing with your with your clients and figuring that out? Yeah. So it's tricky. So I would say that the, the most telling and obvious one, and again, I realize this with my own training and even people who are like more advanced with training is once your performance starts to take like a huge dip from set to set, uh, that's like how I would monitor it in the short term. Like if I'm going, you know, and I'm, I'm hitting a set of five on bench press with like 85 to 90% of whatever my max is. And I complete that. And my next set, I'm absolutely smoked. That's when I'm like, okay, I, I probably push that too close to where I am with failure um, to, to take it like even further. I think, I can't remember who it was, but somebody was talking about how there's a difference between, and this kind of takes it even further, like what we think is training to failure versus like what the body actually can do. And they were saying, look, if you're pulling, you know, sets of three on deadlifts and I put a gun to your head and I say, get another rep, like, are you going to be able to get one? And uh, I mean, obviously we're not trying to say that to like clients or athletes, but I mean, it does, it does say something and we want to be safe. Like if we're under a back squat or something like that, we're not going to push ourselves to the point of getting crushed. Um, but yeah, I would say if, if we're doing it for other people, we, we have to kind of tell them to push themselves. And then, um, I mean, for people who are listening to this podcast and are big into training themselves, um, it's, it's kind of the same thing. I think you just kind of got to go to that point. And it's not something you want to do all the time, but it's almost like, it's almost like a one rep max test in a sense where you're just finding out where you are as opposed to like testing, you know, your 12 rep max on dumbbell bench. Yeah. I'll, I'll throw in like even like plus set. So like on your last set, go eight plus, you know, so you did three Definitely. sets of eight on the last set, do as many as you can on top of that and just see where you're at. Cause then it gauges the next block, totally. you know, where we need totally. to go. Um, I've referenced this study a bunch of times, but it's, uh, I got it from mass research review, Eric Helms reviewed it, but it basically, they had like a group of, I don't know how many guys do bench press and they were basically like, all right, come in, you're going to put your 10 rep max on the bar. You have a spotter, do as many reps as you can, right? They warmed up, probably did all that stuff. Um, the lowest rep count seen in the study was 12 and the highest was 26. And I think that average was about 16, but it just goes to right. show like, here's my 10 rep max. And now every single person, I think there might've been one person now that I think about it, that got like eight. So like out of this huge group that one person overshot it, which just goes to show like when people are trying to put weight on the bar, like I'm not always saying you can do more because sometimes <laughs> you got to check the ego, but there's plenty of times where people need to like kind of question themselves and be like, like you said, gun to your head. And I've actually used that plenty of times. Like, Hey, this RPE, oh, yeah. like RPE 10 gun to your head. I think about <laughs> it like that. Cause it's, it's a good way to describe it. No, that's, that's a really good point. Cause we, we do like, I like doing that in my own training, you know, and I'm a little bit more intuitive cause I've been doing it for a while, but I remember, um, for a while we were like seeing, Hey, maybe people aren't like pushing themselves to the brink where they're like getting adaptation. And so we would do like a three sets of 10 on a dumbbell bench or something like that. And we'd be like, all right, guys, in your last set, you're going to go as many as you can. And there was one, uh, there was one athlete who got like 26 reps. And we were like, okay, you know, at some point, like you're gonna have to push yourself a lot harder than this. And that's kind of some feedback, but like the example I use, and, and I mean, most people listening probably know this. And I'm like, Hey, what happens if you go out in the sun for 30 minutes? Like you're going to get a little bit of a 10. And then if you go out for the sun 30 minutes the next day, like you're going to get it. But at some point, like that's going to stop. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you need to have those like potential, like those like litmus tests, like from time to time where you're going to find out where you are. And I think that goes across the board for, you know, the people who are interested in body composition or strength, like it, at some point, if we're going back to the, this load capacity idea, like you need to have a load that outweighs your capacity just enough to the point where like you can get that adaptation. Yeah. 
that makes sense. I think uh, speaking on adaptation, I'd be, and I know there's no black and white answer for this, so um, feel free to say it depends and then give us a bunch of scenarios because that's usually yeah, of course, the case. Of course. Yeah. But like when we consider adaptation, which is always the goal, right? Somebody wants to be more explosive, bigger, stronger, faster, something. Um, what does this timeline look like from for you in a in a stance of periodization and progression? And what I mean by that is not necessarily like obviously when we consider periodization for an athlete who has a season to play, it's it's a right. little different. You know, there's in season, preseason, off season, postseason. But for um, like, let's just say you're taking somebody through six months of training. Like, how long is each training block? Like, what is your progression method? Are you doing more of a daily undulated where you have multiple ranges of intensity each week, or are you separating it like a block periodization? Like, I'd love for you to kind of, even though there's no one best way, I'd, I'd yeah, love yeah. to hear like your favorite or your most commonly used way of doing this. So, yeah, no, I like, I like this question. So um, I kind of look at it in two ways. If it, whether we're talking about an athlete who has an off season or someone like me and you who's just training year round. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of just like our, our concurrent approach. Like we're gonna, we're gonna bring up all of these qualities um, because we want power to increase. We want maximal strength to increase. We want, you know, conditioning. We wanna build muscle. But if we're dealing with somebody who's more advanced, that's maybe when we're going to shift to like a conjugate approach where we're going to focus on, you know, one quality, uh, we're going to have a secondary quality we're working on, and then we're going to try to like maintain everything else in the meantime. So if we're like plugging that into our template that we were talking about, you know, our, our power, our strength, um, our maximal strength work, and then our accessory strength work, like that's what we're going to adjust. You know, if we're having somebody, if I have somebody who comes in and they're, an advanced trainee. Like if I have you come in and you're advanced trainee, like I'm probably going to take a little bit more of like a conjugate approach with you where we're going to still stick with that template, right? Like we're going to have some power work, but we're going to take it, maybe take away a little bit of that. We might up the volume a little bit on your strength work. Um, and then like you said, like the, in terms of like the longer term periodization thing, like there's a lot of variation. Um, but I, I, and this is like a simple answer, but I think you, you're kind of on the same page. If we have somebody coming in two or three times a week, or if I'm training two or three times a week, I, I'm a big sucker for full body splits. Um, I just like getting that frequency for, for a few reasons. If we have somebody who's like a four or five, maybe we're going to go up or lower or like a push pull lower um, or something like that. And, and in terms of like a short-term basis, I mean, we know if you've been training for a long time, like straight linear progressive overload, like at some point that's going to come to a halt, you know, like if, if it was that easy, we'd add a hundred pounds to our bench every year. So I'll do some sort of, um, yeah, like undulating periodization, whether it's like a short-term scale where we're, you know, week one, we're going sets of 10, week two, we're going sets of eight, week three, we're going sets of six and then back up, um, that's probably like the approach either short or long-term that I'm going to go with most of the time. Um, you're doing like a little bit of a conjugate right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I like that approach in some case, well, actually almost all the time too, because you're constantly getting that variation, but it's like you said, like there are a hundred ways to skin a cat. So um, the, the like simple answer of it depends. And I kind of think it, it, it almost comes down to like personal preference at some point, you know? Um, like for myself, and I think you're kind of this way too. I like, I like having just enough variation to the point where like, I still have fun with it and I still get to experiment with different things. I mean, cause that's, that's most important, obviously, like, and that's what gets us to put in enough effort and same thing as a coach. Um, you want to like find that like variety sweet spot, um, where you're still getting like some form of progression in, um, and I, I do think, especially working with like a, a general population or just ourselves that like trying to find that sweet spot where we can like ensure consistency and hard effort while also like kind of trying to have some sort of like linear progression in there, whether that's changing reps, adding weight, whatever. I like that. I, I mean, that's, that's right up the alley of what I would typically like to do with a lot of people too. I think, and I'd love to get your take on this. I think it changes uh, like, <laughs> this is an obvious statement, but specificity increases as specific needs totally you know so if somebody you have an athlete that you're like man you're strong 
you're you're mobile, you're flexible, but you are slow as fuck. <laughs> like you might do a block periodization approach because you're totally. like, you need to spend a lot of time on power, right? But if you totally. have somebody that's like, you're pretty good across the board or like, what's your goal? Like for me, what's your goal? Well, I want to be stronger. I like to feel like an athlete. I want to be lean. Like it, I, I just have general things and I'm a fitness enthusiast. So like, I want to try new things. I like to totally that, agree. I, I like the experience, you know? So um, I'm less specific. As, as and most people would think the opposite because I do this for a living, but I'm actually right. not specific, which requires less specificity. Oh, to, I'm, I'm totally with you. Yeah. And I mean, you're still going to have like your, I mean, we, like we said, we still have that like basic template, but uh, yeah, no, I almost to a fault. Probably I always mess around with different things. Um, yeah. But, I mean, I think, you, I think you kind of nailed it though. Like we're trying to find that spot where we're meeting them where they are. And, and I know I keep going back to like athletics, right? We're talking about if someone comes in and they're really strong, that they move like molasses. I think you can kind of go with like the same approach for general population. Like if I had, you know, if, if you're a, a big bodybuilder type who's been doing that uh, for two years and you come in, it's like, hey, maybe we're going to try to focus on like maximal strength for a while. And I, I heard you mention this and I can't remember who it was, but it was like the best program for you is the one that you're not doing, you know? And like, I mean, we could take that in a few different directions. Like that could yeah. be a bad thing, but for advanced trainees, like, Hey, maybe there's something to that, you know? I, uh, so, and this is like, there's, I mean, I think it's a, it's a good thing simply because I heard Joe DeFranco say it. And to me, Oh, was it DeFranco? He's, he's a legend. So to me, I was, Oh yeah, we'll take that. Absolutely. If DeFranco says it, whatever, man. Um, Absolutely. But I think, I think, you're right. Like it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword, you know, like I've had people who come to me, they're, they're doing CrossFit uh, and that's all they've done. They started by doing CrossFit and they come to me and they're like, Hey, I want to really improve my body composition. And I'm like, okay, well, like, are you super tied to CrossFit or would you experiment with something else? And they're like, yeah, I would. And it wasn't necessarily that I gave them the perfect program, but that change of pace was just what their body needed. And I think there was a study that actually tried to kind of uh, determine or debate the whole, like, shock your body or shock your, the muscle yeah, yeah. theory, which is obviously a, a bad way of putting it. But what they did is they took a bunch of people and were changing up their training modalities. Um, most of the groups didn't see any changes whatsoever um, across the board. Like it, there was no shocking the system, but there was one group that went from, uh, they were Olympic lifters and athletes. Like that's all they ever did to strict bodybuilding. And they saw like astronomical gains in a very short period of time. And that's a good example of like, okay, maybe shocking the system's kind of true, but it takes a long time of doing the same right. thing before that really works. And, and that's like you said, like there's an advanced lifter who's been doing the same shit at the gym for the last three years. And he comes to you and you're like, you just got to do something different. Like you're going to build more muscle by doing less volume. Cause all you've done is right. a high volume bodybuilding program, you know? Right. Right. No. Yeah. I, I'm with you. And, and, uh, again, that's kind of like where with us, like it's a little bit of a double-edged sword because we're, you know, we're always experimenting with different things. Um, but it, it, it comes down, like, we know that like muscle confusion is like not a thing. And, and when, like, when the study says, like, shocking the system, we kind of know that that's not a thing, but it kind of goes back to, like, that adaptation thing, like, and, and kind of like that, that sunlight, you know, getting tanner thing, like, at some point, you're going to have to find, like, just enough variety to make a change, because, like, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, like, that's what the body does, the body adapts to the demands that you impose on it, you know, and, and if we're talking, like, that doesn't even necessarily have to be and probably in some ca most cases, it shouldn't be like a complete overhaul. Like we can even do it by switching up rep schemes, tempos, um, like slight exercise variations, whether we're going from back squat to front squat to box squat, whatever it is. And so I think that's kind of like where the whole like novelty thing gets a little bit of like a bad rap. And, and a lot of times, you know, rightly so, because people are just doing wads all the time and not, not tracking anything. Um, but yeah, I think it, it, it doesn't require a complete overhaul, but we do want to find like, again, like that sweet spot. I think, uh, I think it was Mike Isotel I had on the podcast that said this, but he was talking about like being sore and he was saying like, uh, muscle damage technically isn't like a direct causation of, of muscle growth, right? Like you, you can't really correlate damage to growth. Um, it's just a byproduct of what it takes to grow kind of thing. Right. He was just saying, he was like, because of that and because of what history has showed us, if you're never getting sore, it's probably not a good sign, you know, right. so I think well, it's right, one of yeah. those things. 
Well, yeah. And it's, it's funny. Cause like, I feel like almost in a way getting sore has gotten like a bad rap also, yeah. you know, it's yeah. like soreness is not a good indicator of a workout, but it's like, Hey, at some point, if you're feeling like flat and not getting sore all the time, like that's probably an indicator that you need to ramp it up or change it, you know, somehow, like either you're not pushing yourself or you're just completely adapted to what you're doing. Like you're going to have to make some sort of change. And like we said, like that could be an intensity thing that could be, you know, switching up frequency exercises, whatever, but I, I'm, I'm with you. Like if I don't get sore for a while in my own training, I'm like, okay, maybe it's time for me to make an adjustment. And, and like, as, as, bad it, as it is sometimes like if i wake up and i'm like smoked sore somewhere i'm like okay i i'm doing i'm doing something i mean if you're crippled all the time you know maybe like step back a little bit but but i'm with you it has gotten a bad rap and i think that there's something to be said i think uh yeah no i 100 percent agree i think i think a lot of people sometimes they lean too hard on science and not enough yeah. on experience you know and i think that's really important because experience is still evidence right? Like it doesn't, right. you can't do a study on everything. And that's, and that's, I mean, the, the evidence-based community is growing and growing. And I, I like to think I'm a part of that. Like I really value research and we have a chief science officer on the team, but I'm the first to be like, well, this is what my experience shows me, you know, and, and I've mm -hmm. worked with people for a long time and gotten great mm -hmm. results, you know? Um, one thing I do want to bring up with you, because we've, we've kind of tiptoed around it quite a few times. Um, but I'm, I'm like a big fan of accessory work. You know, I think a lot of people neglect it. Um, we just spoke about CrossFit. CrossFit dramatically neglects single leg work and mm -hmm. horizontal pulling, for example. But could you give the listeners like, and this might sound like an obvious question or answer to us, but I think there's a lot of people that'll give value out of this. Like, number one, what is an accessory movement? I had somebody ask me the other day, what's the difference between accessory and isolation? And it was kind of like, uh, I mean, semantics, you know, there's, they can right. kind of both be the same thing in certain cases, but um, like, what is an accessory exercise? Why would you want to do it? And then how do you go about choosing which ones for somebody to do? Yeah. So I, I think you could look at this, like it's almost relative to what you're going for. So if we have, you know, like a power lifter, I pretty much look at accessory work for them as whatever we can do to like build up weak links and also work on strengthening their main lifts. If we're working with an athlete, it's like, hey, we're going to add in some accessory work where, you know, we're going to have different qualities being trained or different patterns being trained where we're going to reduce injury risk and, you know, build up your weak, weak links. And then I think for like the average person, we're kind of going to find something in between. But I would say um, I almost like I almost like uh, the term supplementary work, you know, because it really is like supplementing what we do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for everybody, not just athletes, but everyone, you know, bodybuilders, powerlifters, like we said, like general pop athletes, I think single leg work is the first one that comes to mind. Um, and that's just for an array of reasons. I mean, we could talk about, um, I just finished writing up an article about this called Don't Skip Single Leg Day. Mm -hmm. um, and we can talk about how that has its advantages for um, strength, muscle, like if we're, if we're, I could dive into it a little bit, if we're looking at, um, single leg work in terms of muscle growth. So we have like the concept of the bilateral deficit, which pretty much says that we're stronger on one leg individually than we are on both. And I just put something up about this, but like we have an athlete who was doing real foot elevated split squats or Bulgarian split squats, whatever you want to call them with a total load of 206 pounds for six reps on one leg. So he was holding 40 kgs in each hand with the chain. Um, and so he hit that with, with six reps and that's on one leg. If we look at what he's doing for, we had a front squat pretty heavy the week before, it was 285 pounds. So if we're comparing that, he did 285 pounds, I'll say 290, which would be, I don't want to throw too much math, 145 pounds per leg for a rep versus 200 pounds per leg for six reps. So if we're talking about like, uh, if we're talking about someone who, you know, wants to main goals hypertrophy, like that's going to be beneficial for him. Oh, and by the way, it's also going to, you know, strengthen weak links. It's going to address, you know, strength discrepancies between sides. Um, it's going to lead to more strength in the bilateral lifts. And if we're talking with an athlete or, or, you know, somebody who's just like trying to get more quote unquote functional in real life, like training on one leg is going to be huge for them. Um, so that's like the first thing that comes to mind. Like you said, horizontal pulling is a big one. Um, because if we look at the, the main list, we have squat, bench, deadlift, you know, you have your overhead press and like your chin up, pull up. Um, 
and I know that this is a big one in the CrossFit community, like what they lack is the horizontal pulling stuff. Um, so that's a huge one. I mean, if we have, if we're talking shoulder health or athleticism or, you know, just someone who just wants to build up like a big back, um, like that's going to be a huge one. Um, and then I guess if we're going back to like the, the strength and muscle building thing, you know, if we do something as simple as like a dumbbell bench press, like that's going to be in the accessory work, you know, category. Um, that's something that's going to be, you know, targeting muscle, like hypertrophy more directly than a barbell bench press. Um, so I know I'm kind of like going all over the place, but yeah, it's tough to define accessory work in a way, but if I had to boil it down, I would say it's stuff beyond our big basic lifts that are going to target like whatever adaptation we're looking to achieve. And I think again, for like most people, that's going to lead to like that multifaceted improvement. Like we're going to get muscle out of that. We're going to, um, potentially like build up joint connective tissue health from that type of stuff. Um, and we're quite frankly, like we're going to be able to accumulate a lot more volume with that. Like if we're talking about like handling systemic stress or like going to failure, like we were saying, like you can only do that so much with, you know, 300 pounds in your back versus if we're accumulating volume with dumbbells, kettlebells, body weight, and other ways, like that, that's going to probably produce more results because you can accumulate more volume and not absolutely fry yourself. I like the way you put that. Uh, it's kind of determined by the adaptation you're after because like the person that asked me this question commented on one of my videos and I said isolation and he was like, well, doing a deficit push up and dips, isn't that an accessory lift? Cause you're also using your triceps and technically your deltoids. And I was like, theoretically, yes, you're, you're correct. Yeah. However, I wasn't doing the, I was doing the deficit pushups to create a bigger stretch on my chest. The adaptation yeah. I was after is hypertrophy of the pec. So therefore I consider that an isolation exercise. Right. Um, and I think that's, so, so I think that's a good way of, of putting it is just the fact that like, well, it depends on your goal. You know, what is the end goal? Cause I mean, even, even a bicep curl, like that's definitely an isolation exercise, but it could be an accessory. Like if that's yeah, true, point, why not? And, and, um, I would say if we're talking about like, like a push up, what was it? You said dip was the other one. Yeah. Like, you know, if you're, I guess the, the stretch makes it like extreme, like you're really isolating the chest, but that's where like the gray area works. Like, Hey, we're getting a little bit of triceps in there too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess in a way it's kind of semantics, but, um, I think of isolation as like a, well, I get, I mean, I guess it could go either way. You know, it could be like a multi-joint or it could be single. Yeah. But I think I think that kind of like what we're trying to accomplish with it is pretty similar. Like if you're doing, you know, a deficit push up, like, hey, you could just try to be opening up the pecs a little bit, you know, with that stretch, like you said, like it doesn't necessarily have to be a high purchase thing. But, oh, you know, by the way, it's it's going to it's going to do that, too. Yeah, 100 percent. And almost like based on what you were saying before, it almost seems like accessory work should actually be the bulk of your programming, you know, and I think that would you even look at it as like the compound is the test? Like that's like testing our strength. And then the accessory is like really the meat and potatoes of what gets us results. Well, you know what, like now that you mention it, it is interesting because like, if, if I'm looking at it strictly from like a powerlifting perspective, like, okay, yeah, that's going to be like the, the squat bench and deadlift is going to be your bread and butter. But even if you look at like the West side guys, like they, they accumulate most of their volume out. Well, almost all of their volume outside of the big list. And uh, I mean, now that you mention it with our athletes, so we're, we're accumulating a lot more volume with our accessory work too. Um, and if we're going back to like the stress discussion, like that's going to be a better play for most people because it's going to be like in general, more, you know, joint friendly, I should say. Um, you're going to be able to do stuff with like more free movement stuff. Like if you're going to like the push up, like, hey, you're letting the shoulder blades move. You have a little bit more like freedom of movement versus like a bench press where you're going to have like your shoulder blades pinned back most of the time, you know, like you're getting like all tense. And uh, I mean, like, as we see with the West side guys, like if they do that and you're really strong, like you're probably going to run into some issues. Yeah. And I think you could also take in the direction like, Hey, we want to have like good movement in general. And if we get stuck in like one pattern and we don't have like the ability to move differently, you know, like that's going to eventually be some sort of problem. Yeah. And it is like, it is funny because we do categorize it now that you mention it, but like, we're all kind of trying to accomplish the same thing for the most part, like through all of this, you know, um, 
so no, I, I think you pretty much nailed it. I think we can kind of like put them in um, the same category, but we can accumulate a lot more volume with that. I think supplemental is a good title for it. Yeah, right. You're right. Both under that. Yeah, true. And, and it kind of makes the compound seem more important, which for some people it is, but like, yeah. you know, if, if for a, a guy, like we said, like us, you know, who are just trying to, you know, stay strong, muscular, lean, you know, and athletic, like that's probably where we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck. But of course, like we like working on the main stuff. We like pushing like the maximal strength on that stuff. Yeah. I've even had clients where like, I've, I've written a program. They're like, Hey, what? I don't have a compound lift today. I'm like, <laughs> I'm fully aware. Like I'd rather have that squat today. <laughs> or right. that squat. And I think that people kind of just assume that it needs to be that way. But um, man, like in, in actually like in that same post, I had another guy that was like dumbbell bench press isn't as, uh, great of a chest builder as barbell bench press though. And I was like, well, I mean, I would actually argue like <laughs> yeah, hypertrophy standpoint, I can position myself way better with dumbbells to accumulate more tension on my chest. Oh, totally. Barbell is just about moving weight, you know? So oh yeah, true. It's and, and like, like realistically, it. what barbell is going to be like chest on like maybe the bottom third, maybe the bottom half, Yeah. you know, and then we're going to go triceps and, uh, and like, quite frankly, if we're going chest, we're probably going to get a better effect from dumbbell bench. We're probably going to get more from our deficit pushup. And, and even, I mean, you could say that like, Hey, if we're trying to isolate like the triceps or do accessory work for like the triceps, there are probably better options too. If we're going back to like that, like systemic stress thing, mm -hmm. like, Hey, if I go heavy three by three on barbell bench press, and then, you know, chase hypertrophy with a dumbbell bench and then do, you know, whatever, like a rope tricep push down versus doing eight sets of five on bench, like on a barbell bench. Like, I think the first option is going to like blow the second one out of the water, you know, yeah. across the board, like strength, um, joint health, you know, not feeling totally fried. And then that's, those are the ones where you can like kind of push those to failure too. Yeah. Without that, that fear of systemic fatigue. Yeah. That's a good way to kind of frame it because like you said, like even if it, in that front squat and Bulgarian split squat analogy, right? Like pound for pound muscle wise, like the Bulgarian split squat was heavier and, and more created more of a stimulus, more um, tension or stress on the muscle. But the front squat was probably more stressful from a neurological perspective. Right. You know? And, and right. because it's a heavier bar, you have to brace differently. Like even deadlift, back squat, bench press, it's all the same, same in that regard. Like that lift is going to be way more likely to, to require a deload later on or require, like you're going to wake up and feel just zapped. Like we all know that feeling that like there's arguments around like what central nervous system fatigue really is, but we right. all know that feeling, you know, you wake up yeah, and just right. feel lethargic, you just feel zapped. And I, and that's not going to happen from those accessory work um, exercises, but um, something that I've used in the past and then uh, quite a bit actually with clients. And then you wrote an article about it and then I made a post about it and actually shouted you out, but I love it is, is like strength tests using accessory work for strength. Cool. Tests. Like, um, I've done that all the time. Like I, I actually was fucking around. I was working up speaking of conjugate to my one rep max and it was a weighted chin up. And then I just like, I love it. Did a story and was just like, basically like a strength test, half your body weight added to your chin up. Like that's, that's the test. Um, and I'm 170 pounds and it was 90. So it was over that, but like one rep, 90 pound dumbbell. But I was like, Oh, that's a great, that's a great example of another strength test. You know, you did totally. this leg RDL, I think was one, like, what were those strength tests that you, you use? All right. So we got, so we got Bulgarian or rear foot elevated split squat. And these are, these are tough, but I think that they're doable for like advanced trainings. We got the rear foot elevated Bulgarian split squat. You go, uh, total body weight, right? So for me, say I'm 200 pounds, hundred pounds in each hand. And we're going five reps per side. Same thing for single leg RDL. And yeah. that one is, that one's tough. That one's I mean, cool. and, but, but again, like this, I mean, you can make the argument that these are not only better for muscle growth, but like also for figuring out where your wing links are. Yeah. So there were those two, um, you nailed it, the chin up with 50 pounds of external load compared to your body weight. So for me, that would just be a hundred pounds external load. Um, <laughs> there was, gosh, there was, uh, so 50% of your body weight in a dumbbell is what you said? Well, I guess you could say 150% of your body weight 150%. if you're including it. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. for me, I'm 200 pounds and I would put 100 pounds, 100 pounds added load. Okay. Yeah. There was um, a, a one rep max Turkish get up, which you probably got to be like pretty adept at get ups in the first place. But yeah. that was that was half body weight. <laughs> um, 
That one's tough. Yeah, that one, that one's tough. And then actually maybe my favorite one at all is a, a carry with twice your body weight. Mm. And uh, I mean, if we're, and, and all of these, like going back to what we were talking about, like those are things that are going to be really good strength tests and it's not going to cause that much like systemic fatigue compared to loading up a barbell on your back. Yeah. Like we know that like axial loading or, and you could throw different things in here is like one of the biggest contributors to like, like central nervous system fatigue, I guess if you could call it like above all else. And, and you were talking about Dr. Mike. Um, and I kind of, I mean, this is like a little bit of a topic in and of itself, but he was pretty much talking about how the goal of pretty much anything is to like maximize if we're talking in the, you know, the context of bodybuilding, like maximize the stimulus on the muscle while minimizing fatigue elsewhere. Um, and so that, that is part of the reason why I like pushing that accessory work so much because that allows you to accumulate a lot more. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree. I think with the strength tests, the RDL was one of those ones where if I would did a staggered, it was, I was like, okay, I can do this. But as soon as you're like <laughs> literally single leg that the balance yeah. factor is like, fuck, this is a lot. Oh, of it's brutal. Yeah. Brutal. Um, the split squat I, I did the RDL. I could, I, I like literally was like this. Cl- I, and I, I have, but this is a good example of what you're saying. Like I've had two left knee surgeries. Like I'm completely like, there's huge discrepancies. So I have to do a ton of accessory work to try to bring up the other side. So that's always one of those ones where I do my good side and I'm like, okay, here's the real test. Yep. Right. Yep. Let's go to the other side. Oh, and, I've limited range. And, and here's, here's a good one on the same lines. It was a one arm dumbbell bench with uh, half your body weight for five reps. Mm. And, uh, I mean, that kind of get, like, that's, that's a thing too. Or like, Hey, if I have, if I have a strength discrepancy between arms, like I'm going to find out with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, course, great, I, I think for Jen pop, man, I think these are actually more important than compound max effort lifts. Oh, totally agreed. And I think, I think 99.9% of people would be better off if they focused on, you know, quote unquote, like PRing their accessory work, obviously like with reps, you know, like we're not going to hit the accessory Olympics and go like, a one arm dumbbell row max, but, but I do think that if mo- like 99.9% of people would be better off, not only like healthier in general, but you know, like dare I say functionally stronger and probably more muscular and leaner for the most part, if they like prioritized getting really strong on those basic accessory lifts, because I mean, you can train more often. You're probably not going to wake up as fried in the morning. Um, you're less likely to bother yourself like hurt yourself doing you know a single leg split squat than if you're you have a bar on your back um but no i'm i'm with you i think that the like fitness industry strength and conditioning like we'd probably be better off if we stuck to mostly like heavy accessory work yeah i i remember hearing jay ferugia said this years ago and i've always taken it since he's like if your goal is hypertrophy focus less on your one rep max and focus more on your eight rep max and i was like man yeah a great point and and people they is like I, we have a like a little thing in our check check-in form that says like prs for the week and it always says like includes anything like like even that's awesome gym, yeah. but like anything you, anything that you did better this week put it in there that's a pr like if it's if it's a push-up if it's a sit-up if it's a chin-up if it's a turkish get-up whatever it is like prs are prs like you are improving and that's all i give a shit about um one, one last thing I did want, like on the training front that I wanted to cover with you before we go is just, uh, aerobic work and conditioning, like in, in what, what is the importance of that both from an athlete and then also gen pop? And then how are you, um, structuring that? Cause there's obviously different modalities and intensities that we could be using. Totally. Yeah. So that, that's, um, that's a, it's a big topic, but I think, uh, I guess my number one thing is first off saying that we look at conditioning as a whole like in these different buckets right we think like you know there's hit there's like this anaerobic power there's this aerobic you know capacity but like the reality is that the energy system don't really work in isolation um and if we bring up one it's going to bring up all the other qualities so like we have these people who go in and they smash themselves you know with one hour hit sessions um and they never do anything that's like lower intensity I think we kind of go into like a similar, almost like a similar philosophy as we were talking about with like different facets of strength training. Like we want to hit all, all the buckets. Um, But if we're talking about like the benefits of it, and I'll tell you what we do, if we're talking about like the benefits of it, 
like it's huge. And I've noticed this in my own training and we can see when we have athletes who've been, you know, focusing on it too, like we're going to recover faster in between training sessions. We're going to be able to recover faster within a training session and not have to like suck wind in between sets of an exercise. We're going to be able to like maintain peak performance. We're going to be able to increase workload. You know, if our, it, it goes back to like our capacity, we're going to be able to handle more volume. Um, not to mention like the effects on lifespan and long-term health and all that. Um, but I, yeah, so I think it's uh, trying to find like a sweet spot between like our anaerobic crush ourselves type thing and then our lower intensity work. And one of the things that I try to tell people is if we want to do like our lower intensity, like base aerobic stuff, because obviously like that's the foundation, like our aerobic, our aerobic capacity, I guess you could call it. Um, I think that that could be something as simple as going for a 30 minute walk, you know, or, you know, hopping on a bike at the gym for, for 20 minutes. Like that doesn't need to be something that absolutely crushes you. Um, people do go overboard with the anaerobic stuff for sure. And I think that that could be something like if we talk about that, we want to keep that like relatively short. Um, and, and you've talked about this too, but like the, one of the biggest mistakes I see with it is people look at it as a way to lose fat. And we're thinking if we're talking about like losing fat or, or burning a hundred calories, like, okay, all you need to do is just eat one last thing. Um, there one less thing I should say. Um, but so I guess like in terms of what we do with our athletes, we mostly, or general population, like we mostly focus on like higher intensity ish finishers while they're here. Um, because we want to like maximize the time and myself. And I think you too, like we want to maximize the time that we have with training. Um, and so that's when we'll focus on like that anaerobic power, anaerobic capacity type stuff. And then I think it's as simple with the other stuff. Like, Hey, if you want to go in and do like an active recovery day, awesome. You know, you could do, you know, light sled work, um, just like our basic, like GPP general physical preparedness stuff. Um, I know I'm kind of going all over the place, but, but I think in a nutshell, we want to hit that anaerobic stuff, like short and sweet, not going crazy with it. And then mesh that with our lower intensity walking, you know, GPP, light sled work, biking, swimming, whatever it is. Um, because that, that's like a total game changer. I, I do it very similar. I like that because I think that when hit became a popular thing, it was kind of one of those things where like everybody thought like hit burns more calories, burns more fat. So right, I right, right. do that all the time. But the way I always kind of looked at it was like, well, when you go into the gym and you're doing a back squat and you're squatting for 15 to 20 seconds, and then you're taking a couple minutes off and your heart rate goes through the roof when you squat, <laughs> yeah, right. kind of like a high intensity interval. Right. So let's pair that high intensity finisher, that high intensity anaerobic cardio, like you said at the end, because then we can couple all of that really neurological demanding work in one day. And then tomorrow do aerobic stuff because it's low intensity and you can recover from it. Doesn't mean it's not productive. Cause like you said, all the energy systems are connected, which I love the way you put that because the aerobic work is going to help the anaerobic work later on. Um, but I'm a big fan of undulating them back and forth to improve. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. I'm the same way. Yeah. Because if you have somebody who's lifting three days of work, three days a week, and then they're doing high intensity stuff on their off days. Like they're going to be, they're going to be crushed. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing is like when we extend it to a really long period of time, like if we're going in for like an hour long session and we're just absolutely smoking ourselves, like that's going to, that's going to like rob your training capacity for other sessions. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, we could even like, you, like you said, like we could definitely in some cases put lifting into that anaerobic capacity like if, if you hit a set of 12 on each side of like a split squat like you're gonna be smoked yeah 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 100 percent. i think uh i think a good way to look at it too is like if if you're listening to this and you have to deload every few weeks like you you need to you might be going a little too hard you might be yeah doing right it doesn't mean you shouldn't take a deload every four or five weeks you know because i usually every fourth week i think is usually when i deload but very rarely do I get to the point where I'm like, oh, fucking thank God the deload's here. Mm -hmm. You know, like it should be like, all right, I'll deload because I know it's smart mm -hmm. for the long run, you know, but it's not like a, like I absolutely need to. And I think that's the good blend. It's like I'm getting close to that point, so I might as well take it. Totally. Yeah, I'm the same way. And I, I never used to take them. And then I found that and, – and, and like like you said, I did the same thing. Like 
my D load is just going to be like, Hey, cutting down the volume a little bit, you know, maybe like cutting off a training day or something like that. But like, we'll occasionally have those people or I was talking to a guy yesterday who's like a big bodybuilder guy. He's like, man, I'm just feeling absolutely crushed. I'm, and, and he's training six days a week, high intensity, high volume. And I'm like, Hey, your body's telling you something, you know, like you're completely overdoing it. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, all right, man. Uh, that's all the time we got for today. So I'm going to wrap it up there, but I think that was great. I could probably keep going on and on about just, I mean, yeah, there's just sure. so many like little things inside of programming that are, I love talking about. And I know we could just keep going on and on, but, um, before I let you go, tell everybody where they can find you. Cause you post great content, especially around strength training, man. So I want people to be able to go check you out. Oh, uh, thanks, man. I yeah. That. Give us your Instagram, your uh, website, all that kind of stuff. So everything's, uh, titled the same. It's Charlie Gould SCC. Um, Charlie spelled C H A R L E Y, which, uh, pretty much everybody spells wrong. That's all right. But yeah, it's Charlie Gould SCC. That's my website. That's Instagram. Um, I'm most active on Instagram and that's where I post most of my content. A lot of the articles I write, um, website, I try to update pretty regularly, but that's, that's where you'll find me for the most part. Dope, man. I'll put that in the show notes. That way nobody butchers your, the way you spell your name, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's all good. thanks again for coming on, man. I love this talk. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. 